Let us now say in unison our call to God's word. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? And let us pray to the spirit for illumination. Lord, through your spirit, enable us to consider your word and to enact it in our lives to bring you glory and praise. Amen. Alleluia. He has risen from the dead. If you have your Bibles, please open them to the Gospel of Mark, and we'll actually be looking first at a portion of Mark 14. So once you turn to those pages as I am, we can now begin the sermon. The sermon title this morning is going to be taken from the words that the women spoke, a question that they asked as they went to the tomb on the morning, the third day. And the question they asked was this, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? It was a very good question because they had no idea how they were going to get to do what they were sent to do unless the stone was rolled away. It was also a very good question because it's a good question for us. We have over a year been hearing that this is an unprecedented time with unexpected events that have happened. And so we ourselves might be asking, who will roll the, roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? from death that is at the door. As we are in a worldwide pandemic, which thankfully we have vaccines, but we don't have herd immunity yet and things are still not on the clear. We also have a stone rolled in the way because there has been much division and civil unrest within our nation. We just had news events break on the news just this past week. And the week before, we had even heard that there was um, a murder in here in Pataskala. So there's been much on our minds besides our regular life in that we have had illness and sicknesses among us, just as there has been every other year. And we have lost loved ones. Today, we went back to worship at the church, but there were people who were with us last year and the year before because they had passed away, they weren't with us. So we asked the question too, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Who is going to win out over death? We asked that question in this unprecedented time of unexpected events. Well, back at the time of Jesus, it was also an unprecedented time with unexpected events in that when he had come, to be born and to do ministry here on the earth, there was the oppression of the Roman government. So division and civil unrest with that nation too in Israel. And there was much illness and disease among the people who needed healing. And thankfully, Jesus, the Messiah who they had been waiting for for 2000 years had been born and for three years was ministering among them and healing people. And so this was good news that he came to give. But then the day came where those, though, who should have been waiting for him and glad for the good news that he gave, had planned and plotted to kill him. And the time of his arrest came. Now, the interesting thing is, before we go into a little review of that, is what is unprecedented and unexpected about this passage today is by whom it is written, for one thing. It is from the Gospel of Mark. Now, the person's name, his full name is John Mark. We don't know too much about him, except we know that he's a cousin of Barnabas and that Paul, for a time, and Barnabas took John Mark on missionary journeys. And later, Paul worked with John Mark again. But what do we know of his younger years? We don't know very much, except it is quite possible that John Mark actually is in this gospel account, though he's never called by name, but 
the Gospel of John doesn't have John's name. He doesn't call himself by name either. So John Mark apparently appeared in the Gospel at the arrest of Jesus. If you're in your Bibles, turn to Mark 14. And there's a portion when Jesus was being arrested. It says this in verse 50. Then everyone deserted him and fled. Who are those everyone's? Well, most in particular, the disciples, the 12 mature Jewish men who Jesus had chose to walk with him and witness everything about his ministry. When it came to the time of the arrest, they fled and they went into hiding and Jesus was deserted and abandoned and betrayed. Isn't that extraordinary? So they didn't even stay to be eyewitness accounts of the arrest. But there was somebody who did stay the longest. And if we read verses 51 through 52, let me read these to you. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Now, why in the world would we have this little detail that's so embarrassing as a part of this account? Well, commentators say it's because of the person who wrote it being John Mark, and this is a reference to John Mark. You see, John Mark was raised as a Jewish boy, but he was not yet a man. He was just a young man. He was probably one of the youngest disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. It says that this young man was following Jesus, not just that night, but was following Jesus throughout his ministry. So when Jesus talked about, unless you become like a child, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, he might have been referring specifically to John Mark, the young man, John Mark. And this young man was not an adult, we can tell because of what he was wearing. He was wearing nothing but a linen garment. That means his nightshirt his pajamas. Do you ever have the days when you were younger or when your children were younger and you were out at night and you knew that they might fall asleep on the way home so you let them go out in their pajamas? That's what this young man was doing. And he was there to be with Jesus up until the very last moment when everyone else fled. And when he was the last remaining one, they took hold of the garment and he wiggled his way out of it and he too fled. So again, very unusual account, also unusual, because if this is the youngest disciple of Jesus, then why is it that he writes it first? Why isn't the account of John written first? Why isn't the account of Matthew written first? They're two of Jesus's disciples, or even Luke, a well-respected doctor. No, this is written by a young man who was just a child when Jesus was doing ministry, unprecedented and unexpected gospel. Plus, he captures other people who are unprecedented and unexpected as part of the story, who actually ended up seeing and staying to see more than he did. This comes in chapter 15. Now, when we move beyond the arrest to the time of Jesus dying on the cross, and it says in verse 40, some women, those are the unprecedented, unexpected players in the story. Some women were watching. When the men had fled, the women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him. See, they're disciples, they're following him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. So there they were at the cross at a distance. But while Jesus is dying, they were eyewitnesses. They saw it. John Mark didn't see it. The other apostles didn't see it. So John Mark later must have interviewed these women and heard their accounts. Now, what day was this? Well, we know it is Good Friday. And Good Friday, Friday is the, the evening on a Friday evening is when the Sabbath comes. And so earlier than the evening is preparation time. So you have to get your work done before the Sabbath starts. So it says this in verse 42. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, meaning 
They had to prepare, get what work needed to be done before the evening came, before the Sabbath came. That is, they needed to make sure Jesus got buried before the Sabbath. And so there was one who was there, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. Pilate granted it. And so Joseph bought some linen cloth. There's that linen again, just like the young man was wearing, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. There's that stone about which the women asked the question, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. So the women witnessed his death and witnessed his burial. Unprecedented, unexpected, that while the 12 fled, the women watched and were eyewitnesses of the event. Now, some of us came to worship on Good Friday at on Zoom. About 20 of us gathered together, a few more than that are here this morning. And we heard the full accounts of all the gospel accounts. And we had in mind that we needed to realize that there were days of Jesus being in the tomb. He was there Friday night which was the start of the Sabbath, all the way through the night, all the way through Saturday during the day, again, the Sabbath. And then at evening on Saturday, the Sabbath ended. And so they could have done work that evening, but these women had an assignment and were going to go to the tomb and they certainly weren't going to do it at night. They had to leave him there another night, Saturday night, and wait until the sun rose on Sunday morning. That's where the resurrection account in Mark 16 picks up. So let's go ahead and start reading there. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body. You see, they wrapped the body in linen, but they also should have put spices in the body to anoint it, but there wasn't time because it was the Sabbath coming at dark, and it was nearly dark. So they had to wait to do the second duty, the second part of the tradition. So they waited until it was the light of day on Sunday morning, very early on the first day of the week. Just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, on the way to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. Now, they had also heard Jesus say that he would rise on the third day. So they were there to anoint the body, but in the back of their minds, do you think they were also saying, did he rise? Hmm. But when they get there and on their way as they're approaching the tomb and they ask each other, here's the question, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? The question we're asking this year, the question the people had been asking for 2,000 years and during the time of Jesus and that particular day, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, when they ask this question, are they in a brainstorming, problem-solving mode? Are they looking at each other and goes, okay, who has a good idea here how to roll the stone away? They're not strong enough. It, we'll find out in a moment. It's a very large stone. Plus, this stone and this tomb have guards. It doesn't tell us in this account, but in other accounts, it tells us that there have been temple guards and Rome guards set to watch over the tomb, afraid that the disciples were going to rob it of Jesus's body and pretend that he was resurrected. So these women are taking quite a chance going to the tomb, but they have to carry the spices to say that's their purpose for being there. But of course, the guards aren't going to help them roll the stone away. Neither are the disciples who are still in hiding, and they're not strong enough. Now, are they looking at the stone, looking straight forward, trying to figure out, how do we move this thing? No, they know they can't. So what were they doing if not looking at each other or looking at the stone? What were they doing and asking the question? That comes 
in verse four. But when they looked up, well, if they looked up, they must have previously been looking down. Why were they looking down? The tomb wasn't on the ground. The tomb was ahead of them and straight forward. So why were they looking down? Their heads were bowed down, most likely in prayer. That question was a prayer directed to God. Who, God, will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb so that we might carry out this assignment and that we might see if what Jesus said has come to be? And what's the answer to that prayer? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. It wasn't a moment ago, but all of a sudden, when they looked up after the prayer, it was rolled away and it was very large. God answered the prayer just as we hope. He's going to be answering our prayer about the stone being rolled away with the pandemic and civil unrest and with divisions in our nation. So they wondered the same thing in going to the tomb. And of course, they're going to enter it because that's what they came for. As they entered the tomb, then what, what happens then? Do they, what do they see? Well, to their surprise, they saw a young man, another young man. We had the young man at the arrest. Now there's a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. But this young man wasn't really a young man. We can tell by the way he's dressed. In other accounts, it tells us that his clothes shine bright as lightning or whiter than bleach could make them. This young man or one that looked like a young man was really an angel. Some accounts say there were two angels. So it was an angel that greeted, greeted them and they were surprised to see someone there and especially dressed as he was. And so their response, and they were alarmed which is often the case when someone encounters an angel in the scripture. And what do the angels do when people are afraid? This is just what angels say. He says, don't be alarmed. Then he tells them, I know who you are and what you're here for. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. So they're all on the same team. They're all on the same side. And he says, as a messenger of God, an angel means messenger. He has risen. He is not here. Some accounts say, just as he said, he has risen. He is not here. The women, though, are still looking at the angel, still amazed that he's there. They probably even haven't looked at the burial bed. So the angel has to go, look, look, see the place where they laid him. You know where they laid him. You had seen it happen, but now he's gone. He's risen. He's not here. You can't anoint his body his dead body, because he's not dead. His body's resurrected. He's arisen. He's alive. So now the angel, through God, gives them another God-given assignment. And he says this, go, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he said. Jesus had already told them he was going to rise and he would see them again. And so they don't have to wait, though, clear to Galilee. As it turns out, Jesus makes a number of resurrection appearances right there in Jerusalem. And we hear of them, in fact, following this passage. There's another passage in the book of Mark. It's a second resurrection account, but it's not in the earliest manuscript. So it's set apart. But what I love about the second rendition is that it's actually a summary of all the gospel accounts of the full 40 days of resurrection where Jesus appears to person after person after person. But the first person to him he appears, it says this, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. So, even though he hadn't appeared to all the women, at a later point, he appears to Mary Magdalene. And then it says, 
more about what she does, but first let's finish the first passage. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So just like the men, just like John Mark, they were afraid. And so they were afraid of the angel, but now they're afraid to do what the angel says. And they say nothing, at least not at first. But what if Mary Magdalene, who actually sees Jesus, not just the angel, it says this, she went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. So maybe they were also afraid that they wouldn't be believed. But what an extraordinary thing. Not only was the stone rolled away, the prayer is answered in that death does not win. The resurrection wins. Jesus is victor over death. This is the good news. This is why we're believers, isn't it? Because of Christ's resurrection. And even though the women did not originally tell, we hear that Mary Magdalene did. And we understand really that the story had to be told at one point. <clears throat> the account was told because John Mark wrote it down. He wrote down that this is what happened to these women. And they couldn't keep the good news to themselves. So what does this have to do with us? Well, if we've been praying for the stone to be rolled away from the entrance of the tomb, and we receive the good news that Christ is risen, and that death does not win, don't we have this to tell ourselves? Of course we do. And so, at the end of the service, we're going to close with the song that Colin played at the beginning, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. And if you'd like to, I invite you to step away from your computers and go outside and play it loud for everyone to hear. Sing it out loud for everyone to hear. We did this Christmas Eve. We sang Silent Night so everybody would hear. And this morning at church, we left the church building and we went out into the churchyard and we sang it out. So all the community, people who didn't even go to church, could hear the good news. We didn't keep it to ourselves. We told the good news with great joy. And that's what we should be doing. And so we have a chance to do that, just like the women did, because good news should not be kept to ourselves. Alleluia and amen. I'll stop our video.